Anyway, um, she's, she's got a lot of experience in all this. In this role, she oversees the uh, an implementation of multiple seabird, seabird restoration projects on the California islands and the reintroduction of the bald eagle to the Channel Islands. Pretty special. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Andy Little. Presentation, but tonight we're going to talk about seabird restoration on the California islands. And uh, as I as uh, Bob mentioned, I'm Annie Little, and uh, I have worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service for 21 years, based out of uh, San Diego. But I am co-located at uh, Channel Islands National Park now because all my work is out on the Channel Islands. So uh, just a quick. Let's see. Uh-oh. Oh, wait. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Uh, so a little bit of the talk overview. I'll give a little bit of background on uh, seabirds on the Channel Islands, uh, the Montrose Settlements Restoration Program, um, and what makes this place really special in terms of uh, biodiversity and wildlife. Then I'll move into seabird restoration on the islands, and I will focus in on three main types of seabird restoration. One being habitat restoration, and I'll highlight some projects on Santa Cruz Island and Anacapa and Santa Barbara. Uh, the second theme is invasive species removal, and I'll talk about a project on Anacapa that addresses that. And then the third type of project is social attraction. Uh, and I'll discuss the seabird restoration program on Baja California Pacific Islands in Mexico. Uh, and then I did want to point out that all these projects are funded by the Montrose Restoration Program. I'll talk a little bit about who we are and what we do. But these are the six agencies that are represented by that program. So even though I'm Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, I really re represent all these different agencies and their work on this program. So just to kind of take a big picture view of where we are, uh, we are in the Southern California floristic province, one of 34 biological hotspots in the world. And what makes us a, bio a biological hotspot is because we have very high number of endemic species in our area, meaning those species are found nowhere else in the world but in our particular area. We have high levels of biological diversity, meaning the number of different plants and animals you have in a particular area. And to be considered a biological hotspot, you have to have uh, be under severe threat and have lost up to 70% of native vegetation. So it's a good thing, bad thing. We're, we're part of this great diverse area because we have coastal ranges, deserts, mountains. We have this influx and this diversity of habitat types and species, but we're also in an area where we are under constant threat from population pressures and uh, habitat loss. Uh, oh, actually, I wanted to point out one thing. Another, another item with respect to our location is we have the second most uh, threatened and endangered species in Southern California compared to the United States. So we're number two on the list in terms of the number of listed species that we have. Does anybody know where, what place would be number one? Hawaii. Yes, that's right. And, and that's in part because Hawaii is a series of islands, and I'll talk about that. So here are our islands. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the Ch California Channel Islands. There's eight of them. Five of them are within the National Park, the, is this other point? Oh, yeah. the Northern Islands and Santa Barbara. Uh, they're surrounded by uh, one nautical mile within the park, uh, the marine boundary, and then an additional six nautical miles with the, uh, the Northern <coughs> Islands National Marine Sanctuary, which is managed by NOAA. And then you have two military islands, San Nick 
and San Clemente, and then Santa Catalina, which is managed by the um, uh, uh, Catalina Island Conservancy. And as I mentioned earlier, we are a hotspot of biodiversity, and just on land within the Channel Islands, there's over 2,000 species, uh, different plants and animal species, and of those, 145 of them are endemic to the Channel Islands, meaning they're found nowhere else besides the islands. A couple of examples include the Santa Cruz Island scrub jay, a subspecies that is only found on Santa Cruz Island. Um, we have the island buckwheat and an endemic deer mouse. This one is, happens to be on San Nicolas Island, but we have an endemic subspecies on each of our islands of deer mouse. Uh, so islands, just kind of getting back to that island theme, uh, they only represent about 5% of the Earth's land mass, but they're home to 40% of the world's endangered species. And because of their unique isolation and their evolution, uh, we have experienced the highest known uh, extinction rate on islands, uh, has been on islands, with over 80% of known extinctions from 1500 being documented on islands. And some of those threats to islands and by extension seabirds uh, include habitat loss, uh, marine pollution, climate change and ocean temperature change, uh, ocean acidification, harvesting, tourism, and invasive species. And this brings us to the Montrose Chemical Corporation, which this is uh, one of the largest contamination sites uh, in the world. Uh, this is a super fun site located off of the Palos Peninsula. And from the 1940s to early 1970s, the Montrose Chemical Corporation uh, discharged their DDT waste, which is um, an insecticide, into the sewer system. And it came out, this outfall located at White Point here off of um, Bowsford Peninsula. They also discharged an additional 500 metric tons at sea, closer to Catalina Island. And talking about marine pollution, what happened is the DDT contamination and, and also PCBs entered into the marine system, settled into the sediments off the Palisade Peninsula, and made its way up through the marine food web. And the species that were most impacted by this contamination were those at the top of the food chain because the contamination uh, biomagnified as it went up the food chain. So we were documented, documenting uh, large-scale declines of certain species on the Channel Islands, such as the bald eagle, a peregrine falcon, and seabirds, such as California brown pelicans. Um, these species all suffered major reproductive failure because the DDT contamination made them lay thin eggs, and essentially they weren't able to reproduce. <coughs> So in response to these injuries that the, the scientists were documenting out on the Channel Islands, bald eagles had disappeared from the islands by the 1960s. We saw a complete collapse of the brown pelican colony in the late 1960s on Anacapa Island. All these pieces of the puzzle were coming together, and it was determined that this Montrose Chemical Corporation was the source of this pollution, uh, along with other locations, but the main source was um, this particular plant located in Torrance, California. So several federal and state uh, governments brought lawsuit against Montrose Chemical Corporation uh, and other defendants, and the litigation lasted for about 10 years. Uh, it was settled in 2000, and approximately $30 million was made available to restore uh, resources impacted by the DDT. So this brings us back to islands, and even though islands face these enormous threats, they are these beacons for biological diversity. And so when we look at opportunities for conservation and restoration, and where you can have a significant impact, you can look at islands that they're the source of hope and this place that you can really have a, a benefit. So we looked at the different potential projects on the Channel Islands uh, to restore the species that we were charged with trying to recover. And here's just a quick list of 
projects. Um, I was brought on in 2002 to help manage the bird restoration projects. Um, I won't really be talking about eagles today or peregrines, but we had a large scale reintroduction program uh, to Santa Cruz Island uh, starting in 2002. We've also been working with peregrine falcons and monitoring their recovery, which I'm happy to say they have recovered on the Channel Islands. Um, and so have eagles to the main, to the most part. We now have, for eagles in 2017, we had 18 breeding pairs across five of the eight Channel Islands. So um, pretty amazing recovery. Yeah, for eagles. <laughs> um, and peregrines were now past 50 pairs across all eight Channel Islands. So it's, it's been a pretty re amazing recovery for that species. Uh, we have these seabird restoration projects, which I'll talk about. Another project for actually storm petrels on Santa Cruz. We removed feral cats from San Nicolas Island to benefit nesting seabirds out there. It also helped uh, benefit the island fox because the cats and the foxes were competitors. And we have this large scale program on the Baja California Islands, which I'll talk about. So, Looking at seabirds on the Channel Islands, uh, the islands are just absolutely critical for seabirds. Um, most seabirds spend most of their life out at sea and only come to islands to nest. And islands are so important because they're largely free of disturbance um, and they provide the essential nesting habitat. So they serve, the Channel Islands serve as the largest colonies of seabirds. Uh, in Southern California, we have 12 different breeding species and they're the only breeding colonies of brown pelicans uh, in California. Does anybody know which islands the pelicans nest on? Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara and? Anacapa. Anacapa. And they only nest on middle and west Anacapa. There's a, a few, a handful of birds that nest on east, but there's too much disturbance on east Anacapa for the pelicans. They're highly sensitive to human disturbance. But so middle and, and west are really their um, main nesting sites. So who do we have? We have the California brown pelican, as I mentioned, uh, one of the important breeders. The pelicans, this is the Channel Islands are kind of the northern range. Uh, a lot of the pelicans breed in the Gulf of California and along the Baja California Pacific Islands, but uh, the Channel Islands are a really important northern part of the range. We also have the western gull, which uh, you either love them or you hate them, but uh, <laughs> western gulls, uh, they're actually, there are many different species of gulls, and folks largely don't know that the western gull is really restricted to the Southern California Bight area. So it's not one of these really widespread gulls, it's kind of our hometown gull. And so sometimes it doesn't get the respect that it deserves, but uh, the islands, particularly Anacapa and Santa Barbara, are extremely important for the western gull. And anybody know why those islands might be in particular important? The western gulls that nest on the surface. Can anyone think of something about those two islands? That well, it seems like there? it's America's largest Easter basket with all these little nests on the ground. Yes. And all these little eggs. And if you go there during the breeding season, you're in for a treat. Yeah. It's like the movie birds. Yeah. <laughs> um, any, any thoughts about why those are so important for seabirds? There's no uh, depredation by the fox. That's right. There are no foxes on those islands, which is a really important reason why those islands in particular are so important for seabirds, because there's no foxes to, to, take, to take their nests. Uh, we also have pigeon gilmots that nest out on the islands. Uh, Brant's cormorants. Actually, we have three species of cormorants pelagic brants and double crested. Uh, they nest, you largely see them on the cliffs uh, as you're uh, cruising around the islands, but three different species. Uh, black oyster catchers, this kind of falls into the shorebird category, but we really love these birds and they're nesting uh, throughout the intertidal regions, you'll see them. Um, and then we kind of go into the more secretive seabirds of the Channel Islands that largely folks don't know about and hardly ever see, unless you see them out on the water, because they are burrow nesters, or they're also nesting in these tiny little crevices in cliff faces, places that you really don't ever get to see them. But this is one of them, the Cassin's Auklet, the Ashy Storm Petrel, another 
this is a very rare seabird that is only is endemic to the Southern California Bight, meaning it only nests on California Channel Islands and also a little bit into Mexico. Uh, but this species is really um, a, a Channel Islands endemic, California Islands endemic. And then we have the Scripsis murrelet, another um, nocturnal seabird, another reason why you don't see these birds very often. And these guys have such a cool life history because they, they lay their egg, and then after their egg hatches, two days old, the chick comes out, usually they're on a cliff face or in a sea case, the chick will come bounding down the cliff at two days old, and then it's raised out at sea. So pretty amazing. We, we monitor these guys on, particularly on Santa Barbara Island, and often you never see the chick because the monitoring interval, you see a hatched egg and you hope that they made it. But really interesting life history. How for, could it be raised at sea? Um, the parents raise it at sea, and usually... Uh, Does it fly? Uh, no, it's not yet. It just develops at sea. So, I mean, eventually it will, but it will develop its feathers and be taught how to forage at sea. So it, it, flies, on the, it, it on the, flies on the parent? Well, it just bumbles down the cliff. Bumbles. It, doesn't, it doesn't fly at that point, because it's literally... This is a two-day-old chick. Right. So we were really lucky getting this photo, actually, and it'll just fluff ball down the cliff, and then it'll be on the water, and then it will be raised on the water. So unlike most seabirds, where western gulls, for example, will be you know in the nest and and fledge, be on island for a month or two till it has its flight feathers and can actually fly away, these guys develop their feathers on the water. So really, really unique. Okay, so um, talking a little bit about our habitat restoration efforts. Uh, this is Santa Barbara Island, and anybody know this plant? Coriolis. Yes. Yes. So Santa Barbara, we'll talk about it in a little bit. But they said from Palos Verdes, and um, you used to be able to in the past just see a bright yellow spot out on the horizon because of all the Coriolis. But many of these islands have just been um, degraded from introduced goats and rabbits and sheep and all these uh, introduced uh, domestic species, and that has really taken a toll on its habit on the habitat. So what we're trying to do is help restore habitat for these nesting seabirds. Okay, so the first one I want to talk about is scorpion. Uh, scorpion Rock, this is right off of Scorpion Anchorage for those of you who like to visit Santa Cruz Island and, and you may have seen this offshore rock. So we restored um, big scorpion rock and this is little scorpion. Um, and this rock is actually pretty intact with native, native vegetation, but this one was covered with pretty much almost 100% ice plant, uh, crystalline ice plant, which forms this dense mat on top of the island and burrow nesting seabirds can't get through it and, and access burrows. So uh, what our plan was to try and remove the ice plant, put native plants back, and create some of that structure for the birds and protection for them. And these were our target species, oclids, merlets, and petrels. And let's see. <coughs> Here's what it looked like pre-restoration. It, it looks all nice and green, but this is actually all dominated by ice plant. Uh, this is just a thick, thick cover um, that really was impenetrable for seabirds. And we, from 2008 to 2012, planted uh, over 9,000 plants of 21 different species. Uh, another issue out there was we were losing a lot of the topsoil because there wasn't native plants to actually hold any of the soil down. So that was another one of our goals to help stabilize the rock and not lose any more additional habitat. Uh, we wanted to remove the ice plant, which has an extremely deep seed bank, long lived. Uh, so it's, a, it's one of these challenges that we'll be dealing with for decades. Uh, really dealing with ice plant out on the, the Channel Islands. Uh, and we also wanted to monitor seabird response and see if what we were doing was successful. So this project was very logistically challenging. It's on an offshore rock. 
we grew plants in the little nursery there at Scorpion Ranch. Uh, we would skip them out, and we would have a series of volunteers coming up this um, this cliff or this sort of cliff edge, uh, you know, basically passing plant pallets up. And we had to figure out a watering system. These people are really strong. Yeah. These are empty, but we had to we had to bring these up on island, and um, we would pump water off of the Ocean Ranger, the Park Service vessel, and pump it into these um, these big vats, and then water the plants once they got established, or once we outplanted them. Uh, here we are, just in our second uh, second year. You can see. Some of our plants, you can see some of the coreops is starting to, to fill in, um, and this was us planning for a, a second year of out planting. You can see all the flags where we, we wanted um, to infill plants. And then um, over time, we were successful in basically transforming the landscape. So this was pre-restoration. Uh, pre this is when the ice plant dies out and it just becomes this thick mat again. Um, but you can see it up close. And then here we are, um, post-restoration, 2015. Uh, and you can just see the structure that we have now. Um, here's a better picture of it this year in 2017. And now it, it's so dense, actually, that we have a hard time even locating the burrows where, where these seabirds are, which is great. That's, that's what we want. But it's a little hard to say how many now we have nesting out there. But it provides a lot of protection for the birds when they come in. Uh, they're not just picked off by peregrine falcons anymore or barn owls. Um, and it really is this nice diversity. The plants are recruiting, and it's becoming this nice little self-sustaining system out here. We do still need to stay on top of the ice plant. There are pockets that we have to continue to weed, but um, it's, it's pretty neat to see the change out there. OK, so moving on to Santa Barbara Island. Um, this is uh, the smallest island in the park, one square mile. It's located about 40 miles off the coast. Santa Barbara was hammered from um, rabbits and everything else out there. I think they had maybe goats at one point. Um, but the vegetation has been really slow to recover. And it's basically dominated right now by a non-native landscape out there, a, a um, non-native grassland and also ice plants. Uh, here's some of our partners that have helped us with this project. And because uh, it is a desert island, there's no perennial water source out there. So that's been a real challenge with this project, trying to bring out all of our water um, via barge uh, and having to pump it up the island. And this was actually before we had the challenge of not having a dock. For those of you who have been out there recently, the dock got blown out uh, two winters ago, and it has not been fixed yet. So we're kind of on a standstill right now without <coughs> doing active restoration, because it's really impossible to do work out there without a dock. But we have really um, increased our efficiency out there. We started using helicopters to move plants and materials around the island before we were putting them on our backs, basically trying to water. Um, there's, there's been a lot of lessons learned with this project and just challenges with trying to restore an island that uh, doesn't have a water source and is so remote. We don't have any power tools out there or vehicles, so it's all been done by hand. We built a nursery out there that grew uh, about 5,000 plants a year. And from uh, 2007 to 2015, we outplanted over 30,000 plants. All of this was from, collected from seed. The plants were grown from seed, collected on island, uh, and then <coughs> planted, bless you, you. Um, planted with the help of many hundreds of volunteers. So this, all these projects have benefited so much from volunteer help. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, how did you know uh, was it historical? Yeah, we looked at old historical um, vegetation data, what was present. There's also some remnant 
vegetation still remaining, like particularly on the cliff edges, maybe where uh, you know the non-native animals couldn't necessarily get to. We have more of a resemblance of what used to be there. Uh, but a lot of it was just historical records, old photos, looking at what the vegetation types used to be, um, and collecting seed on island from the native plants that were still persisting. Yeah. How did the ice plant get out here? So ice plant used to be used on ships. You guys probably even know this better than I do. Of um, they were a decoration on old ships before. So that was it's ice plant. This particular ice plant, the crystalline ice plant, which is such a problem out on Santa Barbara. Uh, it's a South African native, uh, but it was one of these very hardy species that um, I guess was used on shipping ships throughout um, for trade. And it was originally thought that it was brought out that way. And then birds, and you know, as it became established, uh, birds can move around seeds and wind and other other <coughs> methods. Uh -huh. Was the weeding then manually? Yes, all ma all manually. But we have used some limited herbicide uh, for large pass patches of ice plant. But a lot of it, once we put in the plants. A lot of it is manual weeding because we don't want to um, risk impacting it's our It's a lot of work. It's, it's a ton of work. And we we bring out large volunteer groups that will work, you know, three, four days, and we'll be able to knock out a lot of work during that time. But it's really, uh, you could weed that island for year, I mean, many, many centuries probably, and, and still try and tackle the sea bank. So the wind can bring it through? Yeah, and across. yeah, the wind and also on birds. Birds move, you know, the gulls move vegetation around when they're yes, they making their nests, and so it's um, it's tricky. That's that's our one of our hardest species to deal with out on out on the islands. So we have um, multiple restoration sites. This is the Landing Cove area, so kind of our base of operations is out of that area. That's where our permanent nursery is. Um, and just here are some uh, shots of Landing Cove for those of you who have been out lately. It, it has transformed quite a bit in the areas where we've been working. Um, it, you know, part of the challenge is we have been working during the drought time frame too, which makes it more challenging. But we are starting to see some change uh, in the plots that we've been working in. And over time, we kind of refined our systems, uh, and we started putting everything on drip irrigation, which greatly increased our success of survival, plant survival. Uh -huh. I have a question. I know we get a lot of the fog and stuff. Does that yeah. add to that? Too? You know, Santa Barbara does not get a lot of fog, um, mm -hmm. just being more of the drier island. And I think as habitat restoration, it gets some, but not anything like Santa Rosa. Or where you can really capture some fog and make a difference. Um, I think too the vegetation helps capture fog and when you don't have the native shrubbery to do that um, there's not really um, a good way to capture. But we have seen that when we are established a plant you know it will create a little fog drip right around the, the plant. So it's, I think it will improve the conditions of being able to capture fog out there, but it's not as big of a fog island as, say, Santa Rosa or Miguel, more the other. So you're saying as soon as you, you get the plants going in there, they'll trap more and more moisture? Yeah, it kind of becomes its own little microclimate right there where it can capture the, the fog um, or whatever moisture is in the air, and it does help. Like we'll see recruitment right under the base of the existing uh, plant that we put in there, um, and I think it's just because it creates a nice little micro mm -hmm. So this is just a you know a year difference. Um, I unfortunately don't have a more recent picture, but once we started putting things on drip, it really increased um, the success of the restoration. But here's here's a picture of what we're dealing with in terms of the non-native. So this was a this is one of our restoration sites at Beacon Hill, and all this is ice plant. So coming up, we we sprayed this site before we started working there, um, and then these are natives, some natives that we put in 
but all of this is um, ice plant. So we have to stay on top of it and continue to weed, particularly right around our plants that we put in. What kind of animals do you have on Santa Barbara? Um, there's a variety of songbirds, resident terrestrial songbirds. We have the seabirds, brown pelicans, western gulls, scripps of smurlets, cast and softwits. Um, we have an endemic deer mouse out there, uh, an endemic island night lizard that's only found on uh, Santa Barbara and San Clemente Island. Um, but I think the diversity here uh, could be a lot higher if we had more of the native shrub community. So uh, there, we know of some species like the song sparrow that used to be here that are no longer there. So maybe long term, uh, there could be some species reintroduced eventually, or maybe you know just uh, as the habitat comes back, hopefully some of the uh, birds that used to be there will recolonize again. Oh, so here's one of our here's Landing Cove in 2015, and this is one of our very excited techs. Gabby, who found a Scripps' Merla egg in our restoration site. And we were getting a little frustrated because we started planting in 20, uh, 2007, and this was the first year that we actually had an egg. Um, and it just takes time, habitat yeah. restoration. It did. It has to be. It's like a human touch or something. No, it's fine. Yeah, no. Um, it's, that's not an issue with, with these birds. Um, so it hatched and the bird fledged. But it takes time it, for habitat to mature. And, um, but we're very excited, and now we have birds throughout the site. Um, other things I just wanted to give a feel for some of the other types of, we do a lot of seabird monitoring as well on Santa Barbara Island. Uh, this is the uh, ashy storm petrel being banded. Uh, we'll put up these nets at night and capture them and be able to ban them. Um, and it tells it helps tell us tells us who's breeding on the island. We also monitor pelicans, and here's our scripsis merlin on a nest on Santa Barbara. So moving back north, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the eradication of black rats from Anacapa and invasive species. Probably more than um, most other threats have the most impact on nesting seabirds, particularly black rats. And black rats were on Anacapa, were on actually all three islets, uh, east, middle, and west. And an effort to remove them or eradicate them completely um, occurred in 2001 and two. So rats are just terrible <laughs> for seabirds. Um, and because they're generalists, they actually impact all sorts of things, uh, native, um, invertebrates, uh, lizards, birds, kind of you name it, they, they will, um, they are not picky in what they will eat. So um, there have been a lot of rat eradication projects and mice, uh, non onion mice eradication projects across the world. Um, and this one on Anacapa was, was kind of ground, groundbreaking for the United States because it was the first time that um, an air, rodenticide was used from the air, meaning uh, rodenticide was spread using an aerial helicopter, which is really the only way to ensure coverage across the island. Um, the use of these rodenticides is controversial, but sometimes in, in circumstances like this, when you're trying to basically prevent extinction of certain species, um, it's been justified because you're going to have a short-term impact to certain species, but a long-term benefit overall to the island was, ecosystem. Was it anti uh -huh. It was uh, brodifacone. Was, uh, it's a second-generation anticoagulant that was used. Uh, and there was a really intensive mitigation program. Um, the, it was a phased approach for the project. Here you can see the helicopter um, spreading out bait. But part of well, birds, birds were an, an issue trying to make sure that birds weren't impacted, so we trapped a lot of raptors beforehand so that they wouldn't, be, um, wouldn't have secondary poisoning. We also had a phased approach so that you would always have a population of wild mice in the field. Um, and these mice are all connected because it's an endemic species. 
these mice are all genetically the same. So um, there was a phase approach. A lot, of, a lot of effort went into trying to create this product in the best, uh, most environmentally sensitive way. But we're seeing just tremendous results for Scripps' Merlets. Um, we have increased hatching success to 82%, which from a pre-project start baseline of 30%. Uh, the annual growth in the sea caves has been 11% and 19% in the non-cave plots that we monitor. And the breeding population has increased 5 to 9% um, per year, which if you look at the graphs, it's just like this, just seeing the seabird response. And that's just scriptus merlets. Uh, and we've seen um, new species come in like the cast and socklets weren't confirmed breeding pre-eradication, and then post-eradication now we're starting to finally see the recovery of the species. Same with the uh, Ashy Storm Petrel, we didn't have confirmed breeding in the pre-project, and in 2011 uh, we had our first discovery of um, a nest on the island. So now that the rats are gone, the, the emphasis has now shifted back to the habitat because it's free of that invasive species, we can focus back on trying to create suitable uh, nesting habitat. So this project, um, we, we, Montrose just got involved starting last year, uh, but the Park Service has been chipping away at trying to restore East Santa Kappa Island. There's uh, a lot of work that needs to be done, but um, there's been a, a lot of effort put in so far. So just to give you an example, here's 1978. Um, you can see just the diversity of different native species here um, throughout the island. This is all, look at all this Coreopsis. For those of you who have been on East Anacapa lately, it's basically a monoculture of ice plant, different species of ice plant. And ice plant was actually in, intentionally planted out there by the Coast Guard around some of their buildings uh, just as landscaping purposes. Um, and now we're trying to basically undo some of that and, and try and establish back the, the native vegetation communities. So we've been working um, on the lighthouse slope. Here's the lighthouse. Uh, we started in 2016 on this slope. Uh, this we're out planning this year um, on right adjacent to it, a plot right adjacent. And here's just a picture of where we're working. We know we have a lot of nesting birds here in Landing Cove, so the idea is to try and restore this upland habitat and try and encourage the birds to come on up and start nesting in this area. Um, it also provides a lot of habitat for other resident birds, not just seabirds. Uh, we include a lot of school groups to help with uh, removing ice plant and planting out uh, native plants. This is we get several hundred school uh, school children a year out there, and we're always trying to encourage uh, them to get involved. So that's a big part of the project. And then, um, so last year we out planted 2,500 plants. This year we constructed a new nursery out there and broad tables. Uh, this year we are going to be planting out 5,000 plants and then moving into winter and spring, it'll be all about weeding. So if anybody wants to come weed on <laughs> let me know. My, my email's at the end of this. Doesn't mean we did a lot of free ice plant. What's that? Uh, Does that mean we get a lot of free ice plant? Yeah, you can have as much as you want. <laughs> so you're not supposed to take anything from a national park, so. <laughs> we should. Work it to you, work it to you. <laughs> yeah. Question on the um, talk about the rat. Uh -huh. um, I heard that there was a, a mouse that was uh, repopulated there, and I, I know that the MBS staff has been dealing with that. Um, well, so there's the native deer mouse out there, the endemic deer mouse that's only found on Anacapa Island. So <laughs> during that project, um, I showed you that one map showing the phased approach. The idea of the deer mouse is you always had one population in the field, wild. And then we also had a captive breeding program on East Santa Kappa. So you always kind of had double assurance. You had one population, at least in the field, and one in captivity. So 
so that after the project was all said and done, you could re-establish the mice back onto the island. So the mice are fine. They're, they're doing actually much better than they were pre-project because they were also competitors with the rats. So the, yeah, the endemic deer rats, that was purposeful <coughs> conservation for that species. Uh, so here's our new nursery um, that was literally just constructed a couple months ago. Uh, these, this picture was taken probably two weeks ago, so we have a lot of plants in there ready to go and just started having roots um, out oh, now. Wow. And this was just a very encouraging sign. This plant was actually planted last year in our 2016 plot. So already, you know, we have Western Gulf chicks using the habitat. So that's really, um, we had a great rain year. So that, that helped. We haven't even turned on the drip irrigation yet on Anacapa. Uh, so pretty, pretty amazing um, conditions out there this past year for the restoration. Okay, and so the last project I'm going to highlight is um, on the Baja California Pacific Islands. Uh, they are part of the California archipelago, um, and we share many of the same two bird species um, as those islands. They're really just an extension of the, the California Channel Islands. So uh, there are 21 breeding seabird species, six endemics, and we've been working with partners in Mexico, um, Conservación de Islas, uh, NGO down there that uh, has been working in the field um, establishing this uh, long-term program. So these are the islands that we've been working on, uh, Coronado, Todos Santos, San Martin, San Geronimo, Natividad, and Asuncion, and San Roque. And um, the activities that we've been doing out there uh, include monitoring, just basic monitoring. Uh, there hasn't been a whole lot done on those islands um, consistently. So even just figuring out what do we have on these islands, uh, what are their populations doing. Um, here's a Cassin's Oclet in the natural burrow down there. Uh, we've been doing social attraction, which some of you may be familiar with the Puffin Project in Maine. Has anyone heard of that? Like trying to, uh, social attraction is when you use decoys and mirrors and sound systems to try and attract birds back into a colony. Um, maybe they had a historic colony there and for whatever reason they were extirpated and then you want to bring them back. Well, you can use those social attraction methods and it works. And the birds will think, oh hey, there's, there's one like me, come in and start nesting right next to them. So this is, um, this is actually, these are all decoys here, uh, double, yeah, double crested, and then this is a real bird. <laughs> This is, this is a scene that we will see. And we play the calls, and um, it really looks like uh, a little colony. And then, so the birds think, oh, hey, this is nice. And once you get that established, then you can take away the deep boys. And... Is there as much ice plant in the, on the There, there is a lot of ice plant down there, not as much. Okay. But on particularly uh, Coronados, there is yeah. a lot of ice plant. But as you go farther south, is there less? Yeah, it's not as, it's not as bad. Yeah. Uh, why is that? Uh, good question. I think, I mean, on some of the drier islands, um, there's just not, it's more just open, uh, open terrain. There's not a lot of non-native species. Uh, and you have a lot of grown nesting seabirds down there. Um, but I'm not sure. I mean, they're just lucky so far. And I, part of what we're trying to work with them is to make sure that if they do start getting little populations established to get on top of it because you just don't want it to spread and create that seed bank that we're dealing with up here. Uh -huh. Is Montrose money being used down there also? Yeah, this is part of the Montrose program. And actually, um, we combined forces with another um, trustee council. They're called trustee councils um, from the Luckenbach, which is from San Francisco area. Uh, they had a, a ship that was um, uh, leaking oil. And so they had a sort of similar case, so they had a settlement. We combined our funds and we funded this program jointly. So uh, because we're interested in looking at places where we're going to have the most benefit to our target species, uh, we looked all over. Canada, um, the Luckenbach Council had a project in New Zealand because they were targeting shearwaters that breed in New Zealand, but they were impacted here in our 
coast. So it, the international boundary is, is um, not as relevant as is this a good place to do restoration for these birds. DDT, yep. uh -huh. Yeah, well, and DDT was, you know, it, it included the whole Southern California bite, so the birds on Todos Santos and Coronados, Calpans, failed down there too. So we did see, we did see injury, uh, reproductive failure down there. Well, that's a whole other story. Um, EPA is charged with the basically the cleanup or figuring out what to do for the site. It is a super fun site. Uh, they did try and put a, they did a little pilot study of putting an artificial cap on the most contaminated sites. Basically they put in, they dumped a bunch of clean sediment onto areas where they know, they know a lot of contamination is still. But it really wasn't that successful because it kind of stirred up um, the contamination again. And really, the, the contamination is in deep water. It's very technically challenging to actually try and remediate the site. Um, and actually, EPA is finding through their studies of fish and sediments right now that the contamination is, is subsiding on its own. It's basically just breaking down into different components of DDT now. Um, that's not as toxic. So I think EPA is still trying to figure out what to do out there, um, but I'm not really optimistic that there's going to be an on-site remediation. It's just one of these things that over time, I think the contamination will continue to decrease. And we're seeing, you know, as evidenced by bald eagles now on the Channel Islands, they're able to reproduce. And the contamination is going down. We're seeing it lower in fish and marine mammals. So um, the story is at least encouraging from that aspect. Because they, for a while there, they thought that the, like the dolphin were beginning to adapt themselves. So I was wondering if maybe if the birds really could adapt to. They, they really can't because the DDT uh, just interferes with the whole calcium deposition when they're creating their eggs. Yeah, it's just, it's, it interferes with their, their basically laying down calcium on their eggs. So they, it's not something that they can really um, adapt to in that kind of time frame. It's just we've been fortunate that the levels have been going down, and that's what we're seeing. But for bald eagles, it took 20 years. Uh, 20, well, actually, the first natural hatch on their own was in 2006 on Santa Cruz Island. But they had been, eagles had been, nesting, trying to nest since 1987 on the island. So almost 30 years till they were actually able to, to do it on their own. And I'd be happy to come and give a presentation on bald eagles if you guys ever just want that. It's, it's a really amazing recovery story, but it took a long time for that contamination to go down. Huh? Now once you've re-established the plants, the animals, the birds, mm -hmm. how long before you back off and let nature establish its own equilibrium. Well, that's the goal. And you know, like on Scorpion Rock now, that, that first project I highlighted, hopefully we really won't have to interfere anymore with that site. I mean, we'll a little bit of weeding here and there, but, but it's basically on its own. We haven't watered it for five plus years. Uh, the goal is really to be self-sustaining so that you're not um, having to manage and spend money and but it does take time, and we're not we're not yet at the point where we can walk away from most of these sites. And I think you have to have enough restoration on these islands that it kind of tips the balance towards uh, you know a natural state. Right now, they're so on the other side of not natural, like particularly Anacapa and Santa Barbara, um, that it's going to take probably decades of work to for the upland habitat to to kind of get back write it in on its own. So I think it, I think it kind of depends. Um, also rainfall conditions too. You know when there's drought, it makes everything harder uh, for the, the native plants to survive. So I think that's another sort of wild card in all this. Okay, oh so here's another picture of the decoy colony. <laughs> And then, this is really cool. All these decoys are locally handmade, um, you know, and 
And we have some for terns and different species, albatross. Uh, but they're very effective. Yeah, yeah they're made out of uh, wood and painted. And um, I think they have a fiberglass coating on it. Um, but they, you know, they get pretty dirty during the year. Uh, you gotta clean them up. Huh? 500 of them and 12 and 12. Yeah. So yes, we put out over 500 decoys uh, throughout the islands um, in, in different colonies. Uh, and, and the thing about working in Mexico too is you can really scale up. Um, we've been able to do just a tremendous amount of work down there uh, because of the um, availability of staff and, and just the resources. It's just uh, um, not as expensive to work down there and um, there's a lot of opportunity. So uh, yeah, we've scaled up a lot. <laughs> yeah. once, once the birds realize that they are, that those other birds aren't real, do they stick around? Or do well, they, they don't really, don't think it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're, they're like, Fred, what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, they, 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 they interact with them. I mean, I, they have a bird brain, So they have a big issue where they realize all of a sudden that their neighbor is actually an imposter. <laughs> Removing invasive species, so there are rats, um, cats, 
dogs, all the all these species that were on these islands, they are now free of invasive species. So now the the shift is to trying to restore these populations of birds. Yeah. And um, we also ex do a lot of exchanges with the Mexican biologists uh, because we are working on the same species. Uh, we try and really pro promote bilateral co cooperation um, and learning from each other and, and our techniques. And here's, here's a Casa Zapa chick in that world that I was mentioning. Um, so it's been a really neat program in Mexico, really getting that going. Uh, we've developed a lot of um, trained biologists now that are committed to seabird restoration on those islands. Uh, we've promoted international collaboration and um, it's, been, it's been a neat program to, to get going in. Our funding is, is ending this year, uh, but hopefully it will continue into the future. So just here's a glimpse of where we are for the Montrose program. Um, unfortunately, we had a set pot of money for the bird program, and we've done a good job spending it. Mm -hmm. So we're now down to the last little bits of our money. Uh, the bald eagle and peregrine falcon um, project ends this year, so after December. Um, we funded it for the past 16 years. Uh, we'll do our Anna Kappa Santa Barbara work through 2020, and um, the Baja California project is the last year. We're, we're actively seeking partners, trying to continue the work and, and leverage it and expand it. Um, and if anybody wants to volunteer, that's my email, uh, Annie underscore little at fishandwildlife.gov, fws.gov. So with that, uh, lots of partners. Couldn't have done it without all of the different partners on these projects. And that's it. I was really wondering about that. So. Okay. Yeah, we provide free transportation. You come out on the Park Service boat on Wednesdays. Uh, so if anyone wants to come and help out on Anacapa for a day. Is that a day or overnight? Yeah, it's a day trip. Just a day. <laughs> so it's really nice. You can just come out on 8 o'clock and you can come back and have work. Oh, okay. Good for you. <laughs> Your talking focus has been on the birds uh -huh. and the seabirds, but how, how does that, how do the seabirds kind of like affect the rest of the, the life uh, in that area? Well, seabirds are a really important part of the ecosystem out there. Um, they you know, not only are just integral to feeding other birds, right, they're part of the, the food chain out there. Um, they also provide really important nutrient input into the soils on island, so through their guano, um, that's a really important component of the soil uh, chemistry out there. Uh, and, and seabirds are really a reflection of the health of the marine environment. So we, when we see seabirds failing, that, that's an indication that something is wrong. And in this case, we knew it was a but we also, we also see, um, you know, issues with prey availability, and when we have like that warm water blob off the coast for a while, we really saw in um, lower reproductive success for the seabirds. So they're, you know, they act as these indicators because they directly feed on the ocean, they uh, are impacted by the ocean, so it also provides us an important indicator of how the health of the marine ecosystem when you say your funding is coming out, is that the Montrose money? Yes, yeah, the Montrose money. Mm -hmm. so they're they're going to be out of the picture in a couple of years. Um, well, our restoration program, the bird stuff is winding down. So we're the bird project really 2020, I think, is where we're going to be wrapping up. Um, I mean, hopefully, we will find new partners and we can continue that work in some way. There is a small glimmer of hope that if EPA does nothing on the site, that we might get some more funding from, uh, there's, there's like this $10 million pot of money that could be made available for restoration if EPA does nothing. So there, there's a chance we may get that money, but it's, 
EPA has to figure out what they're doing first. So it's not available anytime soon. Well, you know, I mean, it, that's why we're really trying to find partners right now. And the Park Service will, you know, they're still managing these islands. Uh, they're, they're invested in this work. Uh, so it's it's really just a matter of finding new partners to come in and pick up pick up some of it. But yeah, our pot. What will you do? Well, it just depends on the time of year. Um, in springtime, it's nursery work, so we have volunteers come and help um, move up plants. You know, repot plants. Uh, work in the nursery weed. We have a lot of weed. <laughs> Um, in the restoration site and around the islands. And then if you come out in fall, like right now, we have groups going out through November. Uh, if anyone wants to come plant some plants, um, we're running through, out planting through November. Um, and so and there's always weeding. You can always just come out and weed if you want. But if you want to work with the plants, that's usually spring and summer. That's great. Okay. Thanks for having me, everybody. Thanks for being here. That was a very positive talk. Things are moving forward. All those birds yeah. have restored the islands. Well, that's, that's why terrific. That's island, terrific. island work is, is encouraging. That's great.